Welcome to the AI Chat Podcast. I'm your host, Jaden Schaefer. Today on the podcast, we have the pleasure of being joined by Eden Cohen, who is a product manager at Google. Today on the podcast, I'm super excited. We're going to be talking about um, a whole bunch of really interesting things in AI, diving into you know Eden's perspective and insights, what he's where he's thinking um, AI and AGI is going specifically, all sorts of exciting things. So stick around for that. But uh, yeah, like I mentioned, super excited and uh, welcome to the show today, Eden. Super excited to be here. Thank you for hosting me, Jaden. And like I mentioned, um, you know, you have some great insights. You've been in tech for a while. I would love to uh, hear maybe a little bit about your background and your journey. Like what got you into working in uh, in tech in general and, and into this space? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I've been fascinated with uh, computers and things like computers since uh, a very, very early age, before I knew how to read or write. Like I would have access to calculators. That's the only thing we had at home at the time, similar to a computer. And I, so I knew all about numbers and stuff, really excited with that. And I got my first computer, which was a real clunker even back uh, in the day. That was in 1991. It was a computer you had to hook up to a, to a television. And the okay. only thing to it was a cassette player. So you also had to connect it to a stereo where you would download programs through a cassette player. And, um, and so I had to learn how to program because that was the only way to actually use that computer using um, its own operating system. So from a really young age, I knew I had to learn how to program and I loved that. And fast forward, I'm in high school and I have a lot of um, crappy little programs behind me through the years. Um, but then I stumble upon something that really fascinated me. And that was an early chatbot called Eliza. Have you ever wanted to start your own podcast? I record and publish podcasts on a platform called Spotify for Podcasters, and I absolutely love it. Essentially, you can upload from your phone or computer, and it distributes to every platform that plays podcasts. They support video podcasts, and you can make money on the platform with ads or even podcast subscriptions, something that has made my life so much easier as a podcaster. So if you're interested, I highly recommend you give it a try. You can download the Spotify for Podcast app, or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started on your podcast today. Um, originally made uh, or designed in MIT in the 60s, and I took it as a programming challenge. Can I make something like it, but a lot better? And so that was 1999, and right at the boom of the internet, and I did, in fact, um, come up and develop a pretty good version of Eliza, way better than anything I could find at the time. And I published it and did some SEO and marketing, really primitive, whatever was available freely back then. And it was a smash hit for a while, at least. Um, got millions of downloads. I used to get tons of emails from all over the world with questions and stuff. So that was kind of my foray cool. AI. Really loved it. But soon enough, Myself and the industry, I think we realized that that approach to AI, where you sort of uh, design it using rules, that was going to hit a wall. Like there were fundamental issues of intelligence that just couldn't be worked out that way. And so I set AI aside and I went into a more conventional path to tech and I uh, became a computer software engineer. Uh, worked at Intel, later at other companies, um, currently at Google, before that at Microsoft. Really, the interesting thing happened, I think, five or 10 years ago, where all of a sudden, thanks to deep learning and neural networks, it seemed like AI was uh, resurging, thanks to mm -hmm. advances that were done um, in academia, mostly. And I found myself again, you know, um, working at that intersection of AI and computing, and now most recently at Google, where I'm working on the safety aspects of a lot of the um, interesting AI projects that we have here and deploy on various um, products and platforms. So it's really great to be back, and this time with a technology where the horizon seems very, very promising, but also, as I guess we'll talk about it, there are certainly some risks and uh, I'm very mindful about those too. Yeah. So, I mean, this is so cool. I love to have you on your perspective because you've obviously been, you know, you've, you've been doing this for a very long time um, and, you know, you were one of the the OG people working in kind of the AI space, um, you know, back when you, with the, that first thing you created. So 
tell us a little bit, you know, based off of everything you've been seeing today, we're at a point where there's a lot of these AI models coming out. People are um, looking at their, you know, looking at AGI on the horizon, what that might look like, if it's possible, if it's not, there's all sorts of debates out there. Um, and we have a bunch of, of course, like you mentioned, safety alignment challenges. Talk to us. Uh, maybe I guess just give a brief description of, you know, what AGI is and, you know, why does it pose some really big safety and alignment challenges today? Sure, absolutely. So we have to acknowledge that AGI is a loosely defined term and it's meant to describe an AI that can learn and reason across uh, every domain at the human level and possibly more than that. So, for example... Um, if I taught you a new board game, you would be able to play it. Maybe not great at first, but you would get it, you would try it, you would get better at it. I don't think this is something that we can do today yet with generative AI. They're still not at that level. When we get to that level, that could be you know, one way where we can claim, okay, this is, this is an AI that just accomplished something it was never ever trained on, and it is fairly sophisticated, but not just playing games. It could be anything from basically fulfilling any office job. As long as you can activate an employee via email and chat, you can imagine that a smart computer program, a very smart computer program would be able to accomplish the same thing. So that mm -hmm. is HI. Uh, be careful not to confuse it with generative AI because G and AGI stands for general, but they are different things, even though they sound similar, because um, AI could be capable of generating everything. That's what we see today, but it doesn't possess general intelligence. And that is what AGI will be about. Now, I think there are three important things and just three important things to remember about AGI. So maybe I'll go over them really quickly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first is... Just because AGI is hard to, or because it is hard to define it, it's also going mm -hmm. to be very hard to measure it. And what this means, Jaden, is that there is gonna be a time pretty soon in my view, where we have some AI system, maybe GPT, you know, pick your favorite number or Gemini 3 or whatever. We will get to that system where some experts will claim it's an AGI and other experts will refuse to recognize it as, as AGI. Okay. And we will probably be in this loaded and confusing state for a number of months or years. But eventually, as it gets better and smarter, I think there will be less and less of a doubt that we have in fact reached AGI. So we're not in that period, but that period is coming. And when we get there, it's going to be confusing because there is no clear definition of AGI or even how to measure it. The second uh, thing to remember, um, and that's the good thing, is that AGI will not stop at your human level. It will probably keep improving, and at some point it will clearly be smarter than us. And that's that holds mm -hmm. a lot of promise because there are some problems we've been struggling with for a long time. Anything from a curiosity like what is dark matter, why does dark matter exist? These things can probably be solved using data and evidence that we already have. We just are struggling as people to connect the dots and make sense of them. But we could, in theory, answer those questions. And an AGI with super intelligence should be able to help us. But also very practical things like um, developing precision medicine for all diseases, conquering aging, operating superconductors at room temperature. So a lot of things that can do um, great benefit to humanity. So that's the good stuff about AGI. And the third important thing to remember about AGI is that when we get to that super intelligent creature that's smarter than us, we have to ask what's to prevent this thing from doing things or behaving in ways that further its own goals but come at the expense of us. And the reason we should really be worried about it is that when we humans became the dominant species on the planet, we sort of reconfigured planet Earth to serve our needs and our interests. And that meant farming and deforestation and building industries that brought other species to extinction and so forth. So if AGI does the same, and it may do the same, not because it's necessarily evil, but just because it's selfish and it wants to 
mm-hmm. dominate and rule the world. And what's to prevent us from becoming the next uh, woolly, wo- <laughs> woolly mammoth or dodo or pick your right. thing species? So um, it's a big technological opportunity for sure, maybe the biggest ever in our history, but it's going to be a great challenge to make sure that it serves our interests even as it continues to improve itself and become smarter than us. Yeah. And it's such a fascinating, it's such a fascinating question. Um, And I think also like, you know, to your point, you're talking about how when this comes out, there's going to be a lot of people debating if it is AGI, if it isn't AGI, it's going to be interesting too, because of course you have companies like OpenAI who have all sorts of interesting, um, you know, management structures, finance structures where essentially until AGI comes, they can share like the revenue from their company. But as soon as AGI is there, there's like this cutoff where technically, you know, Microsoft isn't supposed to get the revenue from the, anyway, it's just like kind of crazy because it's like, what is AGI? And of course, Microsoft's going to be sitting there arguing like, no, we haven't reached AGI. We need to keep the revenue coming. There's going to be all sorts of those kind of crazy conversations, but I think broader than just, uh, you know, corporate um you know politics or whatever it is really an important question for like the species uh, of you know humans and everyone and so it's very interesting my question to you is how close do you think we are to an agi or a super intelligence and like do you think we're actually ready for something like that well let me take the last part of that are we ready for it uh probably not we've been the dominant <laughs> for thousands of years um, not only that, like there was no competition, not even by a long shot, because the, the closest species to us um, is so far less intelligent. It never really posed any any threat to us at scale. So um, we're not ready, no. But it doesn't matter if we're, we're ready or not, because we're going there one way or another. If it's not open AI, it will be someone else. And of course, uh, you have more than a dozen labs or about a dozen labs working on it all at once. And that's mm-hmm. not to mention nation state actors that I'm sure are also um, oh, yeah. in that. So it's coming for sure. Um, but the thing I think we got to appreciate is that intelligence is on a spectrum. So um, 20, 30 years ago, for example, you had Deep Blue, which was the first computer that beat a human at a chess world championship that probably had no intelligence at all because even though it was really good at chess even by today's standards i'm sure it's great um it wasn't much smarter than a roomba in the sense that it could just do one thing one thing it was trained on and it could never ever acquire any skill outside of that so on the Mm. axis of intelligence like that was super unintelligent um, now, we're clearly not there today. We have AI chatbots that are undeniably far more intelligent than that. And they're getting more and more intelligent over the last 10 years. I think the progress that we made between 2013 and now is greater than any AI expert in 2013 would have imagined. So we're making huge strides. Um, and I think we're out, we are well on a path to super intelligence. I, I would say we're probably past the halfway mark, at least in terms of how soon we're going to get there. But the thing is, when we do get there, for better or for worse, there will be no going back. And I don't think it could be slowed down at this point. So we have to be ready. We, or okay. We have to be but- ready. So, I mean, all of this kind of begs the question, right? Like it's kind of inevitable in one way or another, right? You mentioned a lot of labs are working on this. Um, It's coming. Are we ready for it? Maybe not now. Maybe we'll try to get more ready for it. There's going to be, that's going to be a big discussion. I think it's definitely top of mind for everybody now that AI is just kind of like the hot topic. Everyone is interested in it. So I think that at least is a step in the right direction where it's not something that's going to be a surprise. Like this is a conversation we're having, right? And um, my question, though, is, you know, how can we ensure that super intelligent systems align with human values and preferences? Like, what can we do or can we do anything to make sure that happens? Yeah, that's extremely important because we want to continue um, having control of our own destiny to say nothing about, you know, other things in the world around us. So this goes to the idea of super alignment, which is. Can you have an AGI that is super intelligent, intelligent on one hand, but also always aligned with human values and uh, human intentions? 
And you can think of a lot of raw AI scenarios, and that's what we're trying to avoid in terms of outcomes or adverse outcomes and unintended consequences. Uh, we want to be autonomous as people. We don't want to re over rely, let's say, on AI for our decisions. And let's face it, the reason everybody does AI these days, other than profit, which is always a good reason to do anything, it, it, it is ultimately to build a better future for humans, not for robots, not for androids, but for humans. So how do we mm -hmm. achieve this? Uh, when AGI is potentially one day, not very far from today, smarter than us. I mean, what's what's to stop it from tricking us into thinking that it is aligned during, say, development and testing? But once it's plugged into the real world with real resources, I mean, it could turn its back on us and basically act in its own interest. So that's something we call deceptive alignment, at least in like mm. AI communities. And that's a really big challenge. I'll give you an idea of one solution to this or one idea for how to approach it. It's still, it lives in the theoretical domain, but I personally like this approach. And it comes from two uh, physicists who are also top AI researchers. One is Max uh, Tegmark. The other is, uh, I think, uh, Steve Oma Hundro. And they believe that it should be possible to build AI systems that only have behaviors or are only allowed to exercise behaviors that they can prove to be compliant with human values. And proof means mathematically proof that these behaviors mm. are compliant with us. And it's similar to a verification approach that we have when we design hardware systems. So we kind of come up with a formal specification for how the hardware should behave and then we can build or see, we have systems and algorithms that can prove that it can only do this and nothing else. And the beauty of this is that it's easy for humans to verify proofs. It's just extremely hard to build proofs. But if we have an AGI and it's super intelligent, well, it should be able to prove to build the proof that it can do no harm to us. So, and if that's possible, there should never be any second guessing about whether a system, even an AGI, complies with the design goals. So this mm -hmm. is one of a growing number of proposals for how you can get to alignment, even in an age of uh, super intelligence. Okay. So I have a question for you, and maybe this is like philosophical or I'm not, you know, I don't know where, where this kind of goes on this, but since you've obviously spent a lot of time working in this space uh, and researching it, I'd be just curious to get your take. So right now it's really important that we're looking at um, these kind of guardrails and these kind of, uh, you know, ways to create alignment. There's a lot of bright minds, you know, the physicists you've mentioned that are working on this, but there's the question that comes up a lot, which is, you know, there's uh, a lot of people talking about, um, the fact that we want this to align with human values. But of course, we know that humans as a species, we are deeply flawed. There's all sorts of um, people that, you know, from different parts of the world that have completely different value or belief systems. There's religions, there's politics, there's humans are, I mean, it's diverse, but there's so many different perspectives. So when you talk about aligning an AI model, um, how do we know, like, you know, like, what do we align it on, I guess, is really my question. Like, what values, what perspectives are are the ones that that win out in the end? And how do we kind of reconcile, I guess, like cultural differences or geographic differences? You know what I mean? Absolutely. I think it's, uh, well, it's the trillion dollar question for sure. I can tell you that even if we all, uh, or even if we designed an AI that only aligns with one culture or one country, or, you know, just a small group that's actually very cohesive in its beliefs, even that would be difficult because we always want contrasting things. We want to have steak every day, but we don't want animal cruelty. We want to mm -hmm. have generous government programs, but we don't want high taxes. Like all these things yeah. are talk with each other. So if we told the AI, your goal is to construct really great government programs, um, but um, you know you can't raise taxes. How is it going to really go around this? And what if it maximizes these two goals somehow, 
But then while doing so, it also decides that the best way to do that is to inject us with certain um, terrible beliefs that just get us to think that what it did is good, even though it's manipulated us from the ground up using its uh, psychological um, smarts. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a very difficult question to answer. I can tell you um, that there are a few ideas though for how to do that. So one category of things to do is so-called outer alignment. And mm -hmm. that's kind of building safeguards around the AI. So you kind of put the AI in a box, in a safety box, and you say, well, here are some things that no matter what, the AI should never do. AI should never exert force against people. AI should never do this and that. And um, if you can actually contain it with circuit breakers, with kill switches and so on, that provides some basic level of alignment. It doesn't mean that everybody will always be happy, but if you succeeded to do it this way, then at least you can um, possibly, hopefully avoid the worst outcomes. Now, there are many flaws here. I mean, you can imagine just like a prison guard and a prisoner, there have been so many cases where the prisoner developed a relationship with the prison guard and then over time got the prison guard to help it escape. So this is a threat mm -hmm. for, for outer alignment as well. But another approach is more a constitutional appro approach. And I think Anthropic have this with their constitutional AI. And that's kind of, maybe you can write certain safety and ethics and oversight um, controls and so on into the agent's core objective function. So you're not being very precise, but you're operating through a constitution. There is some flexibility over time to do certain things, but if you build enough self-supervision and you let the AI have the ability to monitor its own behaviors and predict failures and so on, then at least it could avoid actions that lead to constitutionally bad outcomes. So these are some of the thoughts, but I'm totally with you, like this is all imperfect. Yeah, it's such, so, so interesting. I'm wondering, based off of what you're seeing, um, what regulatory or maybe like policy approaches do you think can be used to uh, enforce or should be used to enforce? Like, should we have regulation and policy um, to help us really have safe, ethical development of AGI? What do you think, what do you think the, the policymakers role in all of this should be? Yeah, so there is, uh, I think, consensus that there is a big role for regulations and policies for several reasons. One is that even if you trust all the major names in AI, everybody can do AI in AGI. Now that it's uh, almost an open source project, what's to stop a decentralized group of people from building an AGI and even an evil AGI if they want? And by the way, we can do a lot of arm harm pre-AGI. You can imagine the state-of-the-art models if they have no safeguards and they're actually fine tuned on bad things like this could have horrific outcomes. So we don't even need to go as far as AGI in that sense. So regulation policy is critical. Um, I think there are some really good ideas coming out there and some of them are even captured by the White House's executive order or by the European Union's AI Act, which I think just um, passed as we record this. Um, so, for example, you can require companies that develop AI and especially AGI to have expert advisory boards with real teeth that will oversee the development of this, assess the risks, alignment, transparency, and so on, and be able to pull the switch if they think the company has gone too far. You could also have uh, phase testing um, requirements similar to drug approval phases. So you kind of require progressively more testing as you move closer and closer to more powerful and complex AGI. Uh, you can create a government agency that oversees this and has the responsibility for coming up with certifications, licensing, reporting requirements, and so on. Um, and I think you can uh, limit the access to this just like you do with other, with controlled substances, with military technology, you can basically restrict certain data sets 
or restrict certain computing resources, you could say, you know, if you need more or if you're using more than a thousand GPUs, well, we're going to treat this as if uh, you're trying to develop a jet engine or you're trying to develop, you know, some biological substance that's uh, tightly regulated. So, so these are things that I think okay. we'll see more of. The question is, can we see them soon enough to have a real impact? Okay. It's such a fascinating conversation. And yeah, there's a lot of bright minds working on this at the moment, um, debating it and whatnot. But as we wrap up this conversation, which has been absolutely phenomenal, Eden, I've gotten so many incredible insights out of this. The last thing I'd love to ask you about is, you know, what happens if we get this wrong? What are some likely future outcomes that could happen, you know, like from I guess, a worst case scenario on, on AGI and alignment? So, you know, uh, Sam Altman, he's one of the biggest cheerleaders of AI. And when he gave a testimony in front of Congress, I think he summarized a similar question by saying that if it goes wrong, it can go quite wrong. That's a big statement. And it's also a big understatement. If we people want to ensure that we remain in control of our own future, I think the next 10 years are really going to be crucial. This is not the first or even the second time where we've developed or discovered a technology that can wipe human beings out. But it will be, Jaden, the first time where we have a technology that can make autonomous decisions and then manipulate us in order to carry those decisions out through us, through humans. And this wasn't the case with nuclear arms or with uh, biological weapons. Those things are deadly, but they couldn't make decisions for us. AGI, which I think will come in the next 10 years, will be in its own unique and perilous category in that sense. And we won't have too many chances to get it right. But if we do, to end on a positive note, then I think utopia is within humanity's reach. So fascinating. I'm so excited to, to see how this progresses, how this um how this winds up, if it's Armageddon or Utopia, um, or maybe somewhere in the middle, most likely. But um, really appreciate you coming on, Eden. This has been a fantastic conversation. Um, to the listeners, uh, you know, if they're interested in following along you and what you're looking at, what you're working on, what's a good a good way for them to uh, follow follow you? Where's a good place for them to follow you? Well, well, I would say, you know, follow great podcasts like this one. This is how I catch up with a lot of what's going on. And um, Google is doing amazing things in this space. And I would say, you know, check out what we're doing in terms of products. We just came out with VAR that has the new Gemini model in it. And get your hands dirty because at the end of the day, the most important thing for everyone these days is to know what AI is capable of. It's very hard to talk about these things without feeling it. So make sure your finger fingers are on the keyboard and you know you're interacting with ai and generative ai with through as many modalities as possible um the more we know about it as a society i think the smarter we will be about how uh we should manage and handle this 100 percent. well thanks again eden for coming on this has been a great conversation to the listener thanks so much for tuning in to the ai chat podcast make sure to rate us wherever you get your podcasts and have a fantastic rest of your day